part that I'm going to be talking about are the propulsion elements. Um, Tom talked about the, uh, the orbiter and uh, the overall shuttle. And the part that I'm going to be focusing on are the propulsion elements. And the big story that I'm going to be talking about is what we did in the propulsion elements um, in testing and why that that led to our success and continues to be a great part of our success. Um, one of the things that, you know, Tom talked about, and I know that Russ will be talking about it, and, and Tommy will be talking about it too, is, and obviously, you know, Bob talked about it also, is, you know, we do have the uh, political engineering that's going on. There are the budget, there are political issues, and there's a lot of things that um, we can't control. We can, we can do a lot to, to do what we can as the government to be affordable and be practical and, and do the right things. But the things that if I look forward and that I hear over and over, and I guess I should back up and say is uh, right now I'm actually wearing three hats um, at Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm the deputy and the shuttle propulsion, which is the deputy over the shuttle propulsion elements. Um, I'm also deputy in the ARIES program, uh, which is in Constellation. And then I've recently um, been asked to help with the planning of the space launch systems. So I'm in the deputy role in that. So I'm trying to be a deputy in three programs, which is kind of tough. However, it is giving me the opportunity to have some of the benefits of lessons learned and paying it forward. So when I'm sitting in a lot of these meetings and listening you know, to Tom and, and Russ and Tommy and a lot of the other folks that are talking, you'll hear Phil Summerall talk about Constellation uh, tomorrow. And I think you'll hear Gary Lyles, who's working with us on SLS, Space Launch Systems. Mm -hmm. He'll be talking about the future, I believe, on Friday. So the part that I'm getting to do is, is get to see what happened in all three programs, see the lessons learned, and kind of understand, and hopefully apply those lessons. It's something to hear about them and receive them, but it's one thing to be able to take it and apply and be a practitioner. Because if not, you keep having experiences gained over and over, and sometimes they can be kind of painful. But the one thing that we kind of look at, and that we are looking at, is, is the same thing that Tom talked about, is requirements definition. When I heard Tom talk about that, that's one of the things that is real important and one of the things that in constellations one could say was either lessons learned or things that we need to do and that we're applying forward is having the, uh, define the baseline. Define what it is, understand what your mission is, try to stick with it, and also don't keep redesigning it as you go along. One of the successes that we had in the propulsion elements in shuttle was to do block changes. Uh, you can't design the perfect vehicle up front, so you have to stick with your baseline and try to stick with that, get your requirements mm -hmm. defined the best you can, because if you don't, that starts driving affordability. If you can't define what it is you want to build, how can you expect a prime contractor or anybody else to stick to those requirements? And that drives cost. And one of the things that we can't afford, as we talked about, was the budget. We can't afford a budget that is... Uh, that is unrealistic, nor can we design a vehicle that's unrealistic to fit within the budget that we have. So that is one of the things we're trying to work on. Again, we talked about affordability, and I know Russ will, will probably be talking about it a lot, but you know, you've gotta be able to build it, you've gotta be able to test it, and you've gotta be able to operate it. And we've gotta make sure as we're designing a vehicle that we have all those phases in mind. We may have a, a vehicle that can be very, very inexpensive, but if you can't maintain it and you can't build it and it doesn't meet the performance requirements, then you really haven't built the vehicle that, that meets the stakeholder needs. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do more and more is have the operabilities up front so that you can afford it and you can afford to sustain it. Because even though the shuttle is a wonderful vehicle, I love it, I've worked on it for 25 years, um, it is expensive. And so there's things that we need to do to make the next vehicle uh, more affordable. Um, the decision processes. One of the things that I really don't have in my charts, but it's one of the decision par um, processes, is one of the things you've got to keep it simple. You've got to make sure you understand roles and responsibilities. You've got to make sure everybody understands their responsibilities and that you can make decisions. A decision is not a time to make another decision to take it up for another decision, another decision. Um, it is important, though, that you hear all the information. So it's important to hear minority opinions and understand what's going on. But it is very important to have roles and responsibilities, make a decision, stick with it, and move forward on it. Um, the right team. You know, I saw the, was it Ham and Biscuit or Ham and Egg Club? I forgot what, what Tom called it. But, 
you know, there's a lot to be said for the leadership team and the team that's on, the people that are on the team. You've got to have the right team and you've got to have teams that work together. You know, one of the things I, I remember working with Tommy Holloway, you know, is when he was program manager in shuttle. He expected Marshall Space Flight Center, Kennedy, and Johnson to work together because we had to pull together as a team, to communicate as a team because you couldn't have a successful orbiter if you didn't, you didn't get it launched right. Um, if the launch team didn't get the orbiter up safely so it could perform its mission, we weren't there. If KSC didn't do the processing and we didn't have the discussion of what we needed, if we didn't work together as a team, we wouldn't get there. And that's no different than what we'll be doing in the future. We've got to have an integrated team. Um, and a, a lot of the other stuff, too, is, is kind of some of the critical processes, but I'll, I think I'll go into a good bit of that as I keep going. Mitigating risk through testing. Um, the, what we'd like to stress, or what I'd like to stress, is the testing is a critical part of understanding flight rationale, understanding your components, understanding your systems. Um, However, one thing we do have to balance, um, you'll see as I go through the shuttle with this complexity and the propulsion elements, we did a lot of testing. Today we're finding that sometimes we can't afford the testing that we did in the past. However, we still have to make sure that we balance so we do the right test. Um, we may not be doing the same number of tests, we may not have some of the same test articles. However, we have to make sure we do test the right critical components, the critical <coughs> systems so that we do understand what we're flying, when we're flying, because we do find out that about 75% of the cost that we experience is through some failures and some redos. You know, once you get it right, you can make it a lot more effective. However, if you go all the way and you st skip steps, and what I mean is not doing it efficiently. You can do things very efficiently and effectively, but if you skip the major steps, it will bite you in the end, more than that. Um, so with, with that said, um, there's different test stands. These are the test stands down at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Um, these are real support to the shuttle main engine test from the A1 test stand, the B2 test stand. Um, we've had the main propulsion test articles and main propulsion. Um, you see this is the, the picture where uh, MPTA, this was the shuttle on the first main propulsion test article. Again, what is the space shuttle? Um, I know that Tom covered a good bit of it. As we said before, you know, STS-1 uh, was launched in April of 1981. It did, uh, his flight was two days, six hours, 20 minutes, and 53 seconds, to be exact. Um, it took 37 orbits, and, and again, we talked about it being the 30th anniversary since STS-1. When you think about the uh, shuttle, it's the first reusable uh, spacecraft. Um, it's very complex, and you'll hear that we'll talk about the complexity, and again, the complexity drives a lot of the cost. That's one of the things going forward. We're trying to design out um, that not lose the performance. Um, each space shuttle was designed for 100 missions. Um, to date, we've thrown, flown 133 missions. You can see the miles. That's a lot of miles, over 530 million miles. Um, it's a unique <laughs> asset. You know, when you think about the parts and its complexity, there's about 2.5 million parts, um, 230 miles of wire, um, 1,500 circuit breakers, and uh, over 27,000 insulated tiles and thermal blankets. So there's, there's a lot going on. And as Bob Cabana talked about, you know, next week we'll be flying STS-134. It'll be OV-105 in the Endeavor. Um, and uh, it's going to be a, a wonderful flight. And one of the things that we'll be talking about, um, you'll hear about it, is you know, some of the activity that's going on, on this, in this mission. Um, it will be supporting Space Station, but there's also some payloads that are going to be on it that's helping uh, with the next generation vehicle. There's things like the docking sensor. There's things like the uh, AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. There's a lot of things that are flying on the shuttle that, as we have progressed in the shuttle life, it's not the same shuttle that we had 30 years ago. It has evolved as time has gone along. It's gotten safer. Um, and we've been able to improve its performance as well as how we can um, support international partners. Again, kind of giving you a little bit more gee whiz on the shuttle. Um, there's, uh, we've supported over 30 missions to International Space Station. Um, it has the ability to not only deliver but retrieve cargo, which is going to be one of the major things that the nation is going to have to worry about. Um, it's uh, been able, we talked about, support International Space Station uh, as well as Hubble telescope mission, missions. Um, there's been over 845 people or over um, 
15 countries that have been a part of the shuttle program. Um, and from that, you know, we've had over 120 technologies that have been derived from the shuttle program. So, as I've said before, there's been a lot of benefits that have come out of the shuttle program and technology. Um, hopefully, one of the things that we've seen with our folks is uh, one of the things we've talked about is from our mission management team training. There's a lot of each one of the teams now. Uh, we do try very hard to keep the same mission managers or programs, program managers in place. However, we have been doing in the shuttle program more and more rotations where like the manager and the deputy will rotate in with missions so that you have a continuous path between learning, but you always have a backup. And that's been one of the things that shuttle has done to try to make sure that we have continuous improvement as, where, as, as well as trying to pay the lessons forward. It's kind of like one of the things that, that we were talking about earlier that Ed said, you know, it depends on the practitioners. You've got to be able to understand it, have the hands-on experience and that's one of the things trying to work with the workforce to get more and more people trained so that you understand uh, what's going on so that when we do fly and fly the next vehicle, we've got some lessons learned so that we understand why we do things. And you don't just change something because you change it. You understand why you're changing it or the importance of it. Again, the shuttle propulsion elements. Um, the solid rocket booster on the upper left-hand corner, the solid rocket motor, the external tank, and the main engine. Um, those are the propulsion elements. Um, Marshall Space Flight Center is responsible for those. However, you'll see that um, even though there are, each one is unique and complex in its own way, but each one of the elements when it comes together to make the vehicle has to work fraw flawlessly for us to have an integrated vehicle. So again, one component by itself uh, doesn't make the shuttle successful. We have to have all of them working together for eight minutes. The teamwork um, that goes together, you'll see that from all over the United States, the Space Shuttle has support from many uh, NASA centers as well as prime contractors from the usable side rocket motor that's in Utah, the Space Shuttle main engines that's in California, there's landing sites, uh, the shuttle program that's in um, Houston, the external tank project office, which is in New Orleans, the SSME test area, which is in Stennis, which I talked about. Um, the alternate turbo pumps, uh, which were Pratt and Whitney Rocketdyne, uh, which is, uh, we've already, you know, supplied, uh, most of these we have already supplied all the, we have supplied all the assets uh, for this mission and the next mission. So many of these places are still open, but we have a lot of our vendors and a lot of our prime contractors that are no longer in full operations. Um, there's also Sod Rocket Booster, which is assembled at Kennedy. Uh, Obviously, Kennedy Space Center, where we are, uh, NASA headquarters, and, and Marshall Space Flight Center. But the key is the team and the communication. Giving just a little bit more FYI facts from a main engine perspective, kind of gives you a feel for um, the different components on the engine. You know, there's a nozzle that has over a thousand tubes that help keep it cooled and, and keep the uh, fuel going through it. There's the high pressure fuel turbo pump, the low pressure fuel ducts, there's low pressure fuel turbo pump. There's the controller, which is the brains of the engine, the low pot, and the uh, high pressure oxygen turbo pump. Kind of gives you a uh, feel for it. It's about 14 feet tall, um, seven feet wide, and weighs about 8,000 pounds, and it has to operate for eight minutes. Um, again, it's uh, a liquid hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, one of the things that I'll go into, but it kind of takes you through the, the engine itself, as far as its performance, there's three main engines per, per orbiter. Um, it's uh, after the uh, solid rocket boosters and motors um, uh, stop burning after 120 seconds, it's the main propulsion that gets you up into space. Um, when you think about the complexity of this vehicle, um, we've had 51 engines that have flown, so they're reusable. They've flown 133 missions. Uh, we've had one in-flight shutdown um, uh, on the engine. And again, the success of that program is because of the amount of testing that's been done. Um, and again, that test, that shutdown, I believe, was more related to a sensor issue. So again, a lot of times it's not necessarily the hardware that gets you, it may be the systems that you have to understand what the systems are telling you and the shutdowns. Again, the total number of seconds that it's operated is about a million seconds. Kind of giving you a little bit of, it, it wouldn't be right if I didn't give you some of the other G whiz on the, on the engine. It, uh, it, the, one of the key parts that I talked about, the high pressure fuel turbo pump, it's got turbine blades in it, and they're one of the most critical parts of that, of that um, pump. And uh, they spin about uh, 600 revolutions per second, 
and uh, each turbine blade produces about 700 horsepower. Um, you think about the horsepower that the three main engines bring out is about 37 million horsepower. And since I'm from Alabama, I've got to tell you that's about 170,000 F-150 pickup trucks. <laughs> or if you like Corvettes, it's about 120,000 Corvettes. So that kind of gives you a feel for the power that comes out of it. We have to tell you about the Hoover Dam, and it's about 13 Hoover Dams. But it kind of gives you a feel for how powerful this is, and it has to operate in temperatures of minus 423 to 6,000 degrees is the extremes it's got to work in. And I think I've given you most of these facts, um, so I won't go through that. But kind of giving you a little bit of history of, of the main engine, and I'll go through each one of them and try to give you a quick history of, of kind of where we are with them. Um, through the March of 2011, uh, we've hot-fired an engine um, uh, 3,156 times. So uh, that equates to, again, the, over the million seconds of testing. Um, the testing began in 1975 at what was then known as the Mississippi Test Facility, now is known as Dennis. Um, again, it took about six years of development to be able to get the engine ready. So when someone says, let's start a new program, and someone says, let's get on it, you know, it's, it's not that easy. You, you have to go through a development process to get there. So that's the amount of time and effort that historically it is taking us to, to be able to, to produce a new engine. Um, that's one of the considerations under the SLS is the ability and time to produce a new engine if that's what a next vehicle uh, generation, next generation vehicle requires. Just kind of give you a, a feel for what it took. Um, there are about 37 tests that were required to get us to uh, initial power level and we had about 12 turbo pumps replacements. So there was a lot of lessons learned. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that Bob Cabana was talking about. You know, you've got to be able to accept some failure. You've got to be able to find out what you don't know. Having a successful failure is, is a good thing. You learn from it. You want to have those failures on the test pad, on the test stand, not on the pad. Um, it took 95 tests to get to 100% power level. As I talked about the liquid oxygen and hydrogen that you've got to be, there's got to be the, mi the correct mixture ratio to get the thrust that you want. Plus, it is a combustible device, so you can have a bad day if it's not mixed correctly. So it took about 95 tests to get it to 100% power level. Again, there were about um, 10 engine failures that occurred. And kind of the bottom line, before we flew the first STS-1, there were um, 726 tests uh, over 24 engines. So again, the big discussion there was it took tests to get us there. And that's one of the things we're going to have to focus on as we go forward, is what are the right tests, what are the modelings that we have to get there. Um, in the engine testing, you know, this historically, um, as I talked about before, there's been about 75 of the total engine cost have come from test failures. Um, again, it is very important, even with the engine, once we started over the program, that we had the development testing, understanding the hardware, the operational testing, which helps you be under, to understand how the critical hardware performed. So once you get it past the design phase, there's things that we learn day in and day out about workmanship, there's wear and tear on the vehicle. There's a lot of things that you learn. There's uh, material substitution that has to happen, obsolescence. So there's a lot of testing that we had to do and will have to do in the future to make sure you understand how that hardware performs. And then a critical part of it is testing, is the off-nominal testing. How close are you to the edge? How do you know you can change that certain parameter? A lot of times we have unintended consequences. Just kind of taking you through the history of the engine, I won't go through it, but. We have changed significantly the, the safety of the engine. This is the block changes that we've gone through. Basically from the beginning at STS-1 to STS-117, we went through block changes, understand the safety and the, the risk of making each one of those changes through test, um, the uh, probability of a catastrophic engine failure from STS-6 was about 1 in 400, now it's about 1 in 1600, 16, actually 1668. So it shows you how the increased uh, reliability of the engines has gone through. From a standpoint on the external tank, um, as you all know, the external tank is uh, also a very complex vehicle. Um, sometimes we hear different people say, well, it's just a tank. Well, the just a tank has gone through many significant block changes itself over time. It's gone from being a, a, a standard weight tank of about 77,000 pounds to a uh, standard weight tank, which is about 70,000 pounds, to a super lightweight tank, which was required in order for us to support International Space Station. That's where a majority of the weight came out in order for us to be able to support Space Station. If the tank had not been able to do that, 
we would not be um, supporting, we would not have flown space station, or we'd have to come up with some other major changes in order to accommodate that. Again, it had a block change velocity. Um, it, the external tank is made up of the LO2 tank, the inner tank, and the LH2 uh, tank supplies the main engine. Um, again, when you think about this, it's the structural backbone of the shuttle. It's got about a quarter inch thick, is about how thick it is, but yet it has to be able to hold more than 1.5 million pounds of propellant. So it's, it's amazing when you think about the size of it and how thick it is, lack of thickness, and how it structurally um, had to be able to support what we, the structural backbone of the shuttle. Again, how we got there with the external tank was again, there was specific testing that we did on material, understanding the foam and ablative. You know, one of the stories, Jim Odovum, he were up here telling you this, he would talk about that the first um, test that we did, or tanking test of the external tank, the, the foam fell off. Um, and that's one of the things I believe that SpaceX also had to deal with was when they did some of the first tanking, what you think you know about thermal protection system, it's unique. Um, the component testing, there was a lot of um, emphasis put on structural testing, understanding how the materials came together, the strength of the tank, and that's what led to the ability to take the tank and, and get about 15,000 pounds out of it because we, we built it strong to begin with, had a baseline, and then as we had to get performance out of it or had to do manufacturing things to get more performance out of it, we were able to take those steps. And again, the process that we went through were structural test orders, articles, which the first test had about over a thousand strain gauges, understanding it. And that also has helped significantly with our modeling. A lot of those models that we use today uh, developed, and then we just keep refining those models. That's also going to be one of the things that will help us save costs where we can't afford to do some major structural tests. We'll be able to do modeling because we've reinforced that we understand that our models are correct. Um, Again, I think I've talked about a lot of this as far as pre-flight testing, the importance of test and verification, and making sure that we understand what we've done. And again, I've already talked about the 18,000 pound work reduction. Um, and again, that's the thought process that we go today. And as y'all know, you know, from the external tank um, within shuttle, you know, we've had 133, 133 missions, 131 of them were successful. We've had incidents which we've had to learn the hard lessons from, the Challenger incident and the Columbia. The external tank um, after Columbia went through some significant changes as far as understanding um, the thermal protection system and what it takes to be safe. So the in, as we have gone through this, we are always learning. Right when you think that the shuttle is operational, you learn very quick. Things that you think you know can bite you very quick that you think are a maintenance issue or you think are not an issue, you find out very quick they are. So there's still a lot of rigor that goes into process improvements, design improvements, and a critical part is post-flight. So the external tank is not reusable, but what we do is we have imagery today that once we launch a shuttle, we look at all the films of the external tank on asset. We try, ascent. We try to make sure that it's a daylight launch if possible so that we get imagery to understand what has happened with the thermal protection system. The next piece part is the booster. Um, the solid rocket booster is made up of what we call the booster and the motor. Uh, we have two um, contractors that supply the booster and the motor. Again, from, from its performance, um, you'll see that uh, it burns from 123 seconds. Um, it is what we call um, the powerhouse. If you talk to the RSRB folks, they'll tell you it's the powerhouse where the external tank may be the backbone. The booster will tell you they're the powerhouse of the shuttle. Um, it was designed uh, for 20 flights reuse. Um, again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's amazing facts on it is that when you think about the solid rocket boosters, it's got structures, it's got avionics, it's got range safety system, the destruct system, um, the separation system and recovery system. So the solid rocket booster not only has to have electronic and guidance, it has to have structure and the propellant. One of the things that you'll hear us talk about with the solid rocket booster is, um, I'll just keep skipping just a little bit, is that the, uh, the qualification program, even on the booster, has been very important to it. Test what you fly, fly what you test. Um, there's solid rocket motors, there's the reusable solid rocket motor as we've gone through uh, evolution. Critical parts are the testing, the engineering test motor, which uh, is the marginal test, which tests the, the boxes so we understand how a motor perform in the edges of it. Also, when we've started production or that we've gone through a production process or slowdown, 
We also have uh, made sure that any change that we make to the motor that we test it, because you keep in mind, the engines can be green run. So we green run each engine before we fly it. You can't green run a motor. So we have to, what we have to do is we have flight support motors that uh, about once a year, once every 18 months, it represents the hardware that we're going to be flying. If there's been changes, modification, obsolescence issue, we test it before we fly. And I'm getting the times up. Um, again, full scale motor. Uh, I know y'all will be able to get a copy of these charts. Again, going to the side rocket, there's been many parts, piece parts, system tests that makes it successful, structural test. Um, again, the thought of this is test before you fly, fly before you test. And one of the things that I wanted to, to leave you with is, is since I'm coming off the heels of a, a, a flight readiness review from yesterday, one of the things that's uh, really critical that I think that uh, we all have got to remember, and to me this is something that I hope we always are passing it on to the next generation, and it's, it's definitely something that is the tenet of, of what I hear us talk about when we talk about our readiness to fly. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard it referred to, but it's the seven elements of good flight rationale. And I think it's worth sharing. Um, there's seven elements that we look at when we're getting ready to fly a, a shuttle. Um, number one is solid technical understanding. Is do you understand the root cause of an issue? Is it based on engineering judgment? Is it a gut feel? Or do you truly have the physics that you understand what is going on with the technical understanding of an issue? Sometimes you don't always get that. So there's some other things that you do to back yourself up. Have you seen it before? Do you understand it relative to experience base? Is it the first time you've seen it? Have you experienced it in ground test? Or have you seen it in flight so that you understand it? A bounding case. Do you understand that you have a little bit of margin in there? Do you have a physics-based understanding and that you understand that your environments, you understand your environments, and maybe you even have test data or you have some modeling that you have done. You have your models that you can say, I can predict this. And that was one of the things that Tom brought up is the ability to justify and understand your model. So that's something when you think that right now during this, the time of, of where we're going from one program to another, it's real important that you understand the physics, understand the models, understand the vehicle, so that as we go forward, you understand how that vehicle is to perform. Um, Self-limiting aspects. If you have an issue, do you know it's as worse as it can be? You know, one of the things is what if you're wrong? So make sure you can answer that question. Now, I'm not saying that we know the answers to all of this, but this is how you kind of do the risk assessment to say, can I answer most of these to a very good, and can I prove to the community that's reviewing it that I can answer these questions? Is the margins understood? Um, is it adequately reduced from the baseline? Um, a data based on ass assessment, uh, test analysis, it's not a gut feel. And one of the critical things is the interaction with other elements and conditions. Do you understand the condition? Do you know your impact on another element? And have you communicated it to all parties involved? So that's one of the important things. Again, the teamwork, the communication, understanding. When something's happening, when we've had a, uh, something that's been processed, that's important to us understanding what's going on with our vehicle. Us telling, processing what's happening with our vehicle and the importance of it's real important. So with all that said, that kind of gives you a feel for the teamwork, what's important. <laughs> and again, before he gets the cane and gets me off the stage, um, I just wanted to tell y'all thank you and uh, thanks for the work you're doing. And uh, any time that we can be of help to support, you know, teach us too. It's a, a pleasure working at NASA. It's a, it's a fun time, even though it's a challenging time. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to, to working with you across many centers. And uh, let's, let's go do this. So thank you. <laughs>